Today's episode of Expanded Perspectives is sponsored by Gaia.com. Help find your own truth by exploring perspectives you won't find in the mainstream on some of life's biggest mysteries, whether it's grand conspiracies, breakaway societies, UFOs, ancient civilizations, lost wisdom, as well as the paranormal, all at your fingertips. Stream videos anywhere from your living room or on the go with the Gaia app, available through the App Store or Google Play. This will give you access to over 7,000 titles, all available to you with a monthly plan for only $9.95 a month. If you sign up now, your first month is only $0.99. Cents. There are multiple plans to choose from, including a three-month plan and an annual plan. You'll have access to incredible shows only available on Gaia, like Truth Hunter, Buzzsaw, Cosmic Disclosure, Beyond Belief, Missing Links, Hidden Origins, and Deep Space. Gaia is available on your Android or iPhone, Roku, Apple TV, and Amazon Fire TV. If you enjoy expanding your perspective, then you'll enjoy Gaia.com. That's G-A-I-A dot com forward slash expanded perspectives. That's all one word, folks. G-A-I-A dot com forward slash expanded perspectives. Let's start the show. is going on everybody and thanks again for joining us here on expanded perspectives with me cam hale and of course i know y'all are wondering is there somebody new in there and today folks you would be wrong there's nobody new in here it is still <laughs> the great beast himself kyle filson how's it going everybody i'm thrilled to be here uh happy mother's day to all you people out there all you ladies all you people to all you yeah. ladies that are lucky enough to have children <laughs> yeah Happy Mother's Day to you. We had a good one at my house. How about you, Cam? Oh, yeah. Had a great Mother's Day. A little day drinking. You can't hate on that on Mother's Day. We did, too. We had uh, some sangria. We had some mimosas and some poinsettias. <laughs> wow. You're yeah. eating flowers? Right. No, 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 no. no. The poinsettia, I believe, is supposed to be like cranberry juice and... and uh, uh, champagne instead of the OJ and champagne. I gotcha. You're yeah. popping bottles of Cristal. Just going off. Yeah, with my mother and my mother in law. You get those two knuckleheads together. I mean, it really is something else with them two. Really. <laughs> like, you're just looking at them like, gosh, I'm not. I look at my wife and I'm like, I hope you don't turn out like your mother, which is crazy, folks, <laughs> if you're asking what that is. I'll tell you how crazy it was. She asked for a to go box. Okay. We went to a really nice a Mexican restaurant here and it's. The food is amazing. I mean, it is. I love it. And they have this big brunch thing. So we're all sitting there and we're eating this big spread. And my mother-in-law wants to take something home with her. So she asks for a box from the young man. And he's like, okay, I'll be right back. You know, and he leaves. Well, instead of waiting for him to bring the box back, she gets a tortilla. And she just takes her fork and starts filling the tortilla up, scoops it, piles it full of what she's going to take home. And then she just sits there holding it. And it starts dripping and running, and she's just like, what do I do now? And I'm like, well, maybe you shouldn't have just picked it all up. How about that? So she has like five more tortillas left. So I'm like, quick, wrap them in tortillas. 
because I'm that kind of jerk. So she starts rapping like top and bottom and top and bottom till it's this giant multi doughy mess. doughy mess. And then he finally shows up with the box and he's looking at her and he looks at me and I just shake my head <laughs> and give it back to her. I'm like, it's such a train wreck. You and the waiter she- shared a moment where you both understood without speaking. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> exactly. That's exactly what happened. Uh, speaking of sharing a moment, You were trying to tell me something. We were talking about like kids and doing crazy gross things and stuff like that. And you're like, wait till the show starts. I've got something to tell you. What is this gross thing you've got to tell me? Yeah, well, let's start into it. It's in the news section. Uh, There's an article by the science editor over at the Telegraph named Sarah Napton. And she wrote this pretty interesting article about how eating boogers is actually good for teeth and <gasps> overall health. <laughs> yeah, that's right. It says it might be wise to look away now if you are eating or have a weak stomach. But scientists have discovered that ingesting... Stop, 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 folks. If you're eating or anything, stop them till you get done <laughs> and then come back. Just hit pause. <laughs> that's <laughs> Scientists have discovered that ingesting boogers is good for teeth and your overall health. Scientists at a number of universities, including Harvard and the University of Saskatchewan, and say parents should not discourage their children from picking their noses because they contain a rich reservoir of good bacteria. Oh, God. It says eating snot can also prevent bacteria from sticking to teeth. According to an article published in the Journal of American Society, uh, Society for Microbiology. You know why that is? It's because stomach acid, when you vomit, rinses it <laughs> off as it comes out. Oh. The findings even suggest that snot could defend against respiratory infections, stomach ulcers, and even HIV. What? The researchers are given, uh, they're working on what they say is creating a synthetic mucus toothpaste and chewing gum to harness the dental benefits of boogers. Now, a guy named Dr. Scott Knapper who's a professor of biochemistry at the University of Saskatchewan, says that nature pushes us to do different things because it is to our advantage to have certain behaviors, to consume different types of food. So maybe when you have the urge to pick your nose and eat it, you should just go with nature. From an evolutionary perspective, we evolved under very dirty conditions, and maybe this desire to keep our environment and our behaviors sterile isn't actually working to our advantage There's also a guy who's an Austrian lung specialist named Professor Friedrich Bissinger, who also contributed to the study. And he said that research has shown people who pick their noses are healthy, happier, and probably better in tune with their bodies. He says that eating the dry remains of what you pull out is a great way of strengthening the body's immune system. Medically, it makes great sense, and it's perfectly a natural thing to do in terms of the immune system. The nose is a filter in which a great deal of bacteria is collected (laughs) i mean look regardless of what the details say look there's a lot of stuff that comes in you're supposed to drink this many glasses of water every day you're not supposed to eat fatty food you're not supposed to drink beer you're not supposed to there's lots of things you're supposed to do this is one i'm another one of those in that category i'm not getting on board (laughs) you're gonna you're gonna bow out grace not only do i bow, i'm going to continue to tell luke to quit eating his burgers (laughs) but for y'all that want to give it a go go for it (laughs) oh that's hard to get through. That's really. I always think back of what is it called? Bean boozled into the Jelly Belly game. That's got all the crazy yeah, flavors. And yeah. Jets. Oh, the ah. twins have pulled that on me a couple Christmases. Yeah, right. Yeah, yeah. That's not cool at all. Well, I got something that is pretty cool. And I think I for one enjoy it. But Philly, I think you're going to get a kick out of this. It's something that you and I talk about. Like you're trying to always identify flying, you know, objects, things like this. This comes from our homie Roger Marsh over there at OpenMinds.tv, folks. He posted this up on May 11th. The Canadian witness says a UFO followed the car 20 foot overhead. Now, this is an Edson reported a glowing of the Canadian witness living there at Edson. This glowing object following her vehicle just 20 foot overhead, 20 feet. That was it. That's pretty close. That's really close. Get out your pens and pencils, folks. Case number 83272 states this, that the witness was returning home from the hospital at 10 p.m. on April 19th of 2017, when said incident occurred. The witness states this. It was about a 15-minute drive, but felt much longer that night. No vehicles in sight, and out of nowhere, a bright yellow-colored light appeared in my rearview mirror, nearly blinding me. Says that the witness first thought the light might be a vehicle approaching from behind, and she states that I continued driving and slowed down a little, hoping it was passing me. That's when it started to speed up, and that's when I realized it was above the car, maybe a 20-foot distance. 
The witness describes this. She said that I noticed it was a bright yellow orange color and glowed. I could not make out the details as it was too bright. I sped up to get away from it, but it continued at the same speed overhead. For about 15 minutes, it remained this way. When I got closer to my destination, I went down a hill to get to my turn and I slowed right down. The UFO then abruptly changed directions towards where I was headed to, hovered above the property, and then the UFO glowing light went dim and disappeared into the darkness of the night. Wow. So I was, first of all, the reason I bring it up is you're always talking about drones. Yep. All right. you, she doesn't state the speed upon which she was traveling. So right. I'm not I'm as, I don't know if she's doing 55, 25, or 75. I have no clue, okay? Right. I'm with you. But she's saying 15 minutes. How fast and how long can one of those drones fly if if they're saying it's doing at that speed? Like, I don't know how fast a drone can travel, okay? I've seen some that can go up to 50 miles an hour, but I'm sure that there's other ones. But what's following, what I'm also getting at is how did it stay, if it is a drone, this is all devil's advocate, hypothetically speaking, if it was somebody with a drone that had it set up to look like this, how did it stay tracking above that car for at least 15 minutes or more at different speeds to know where she was going to break away and hover over the property before it went dark. Yeah, you'd have to be a hell of a pilot. And you'd have to be have her in view, line of sight the entire time, and know what you, you'd have to be watching her through the camera to try to keep it exactly above her. That's why I don't think it was a drone. It doesn't seem like that. This is That's why I'm getting is It's a, a ball, like a glowing, but it doesn't seem like a drone, and it was close enough. Don't you think? Now, I wish you'd say something about the sounds or anything like that but don't you think you would have been able to look up and see if you thought it was a drone only 20 foot ahead yeah i would think Just so that's it so anyway that's what got drew me into this whole thing is like this one is very unique that's cool speaking of something else that's cool this comes from the los angeles times by deborah netburn and it's about the great american eclipse cam is only 100 days away yes. i forgot about this It talks about later this summer, darkness will fall across the face of America. The birds will stop singing, temperatures will drop, and the stars will become visible in the daytime sky. In around 100 days, a total solar eclipse will sweep across the continental United States for the first time since 1918. Astronomers are calling it the Great American Eclipse. It says for amateur sky watchers, a total eclipse presents a rare opportunity to witness a cosmic hiccup in our day-night cycle. For solar astronomers, however, though, this eclipse offers something else. Three minutes, give or take, to collect as much data as possible about the sun's unusually hidden outer atmosphere. Researchers have been anticipating this event for years. Some will take measurements from the sky. Others have engaged in vast networks of citizen scientists to help track the eclipse as its shadow moves across the ground. Ultimately, they hope that their findings will tell them more about the sun's magnetic field, the temperature of its outer atmosphere, and how energy moves through the star and into outer space. The sun is so bright that even when 99% of it is covered by the moon, the remaining 1% is still bright enough to make the sky blue. However, during a total solar eclipse, the moon completely obscures the face of the sun, causing the daytime sky to darken by a factor of 1 million. It says a total solar eclipse occurs somewhere on Earth about every 18 months somewhere, and it can happen literally anywhere. That means that most eclipse chasers have to travel far from home to see one for themselves. On August 21st, though, what's known as the Path of Totality will cut a 60-mile-wide arc across the middle of the United States, beginning in Oregon at 10.15 a.m. local time and ending in South Carolina about an hour and a half later. Now, experts estimate that 11 million people won't have to travel at all to observe the total eclipse, and an estimated 76 million more will all be within a 200-mile drive of it. Now, because of this unusual accessibility, it'll probably be the most viewed total eclipse of all time. Scientists expect it won't it'll also be the most studied eclipse of all time. Most researchers plan to study suns, the sun's outer atmosphere known as the corona. This is a vast region of superheated gas held in place by the sun's magnetic field, and this story... The reason I'm bringing it up is because I kind of forgot about it. One of our listeners months ago invited us to come up to the brewery there in Oregon Mm -hmm. because I think they're going to be having a a, you know a festival to celebrate this eclipse. Right? Even sent us some awesome caps, which I wear all the time, by the way. Uh, So I kind of forgot about this, 
But this is going to be really cool. You know, like they said, there's eclipses all the time, every 18 months or so, somewhere in the world. But this is a rare time where we're going to have a total eclipse go right over the center of the United States. I wished I lived north of here because, unfortunately, we're too far south. So when we see it, Cam, it'll only look like 75% of the yeah. sun's covered up. It'll still probably be a blue sky. But if you're in the middle of the United States, like, say, Kansas City, or even where Micah Hanks is in Asheville, mm-hmm. it's supposedly in the middle of the day, it won't even be blue. You'll be able to see the stars in the sky oh, during the middle of man. the day. Hasn't happened since 1918. So that's going to be really cool, right? I would love to see that. I mean, I'm sure you could watch it on video, but yeah. still, to see it, I don't I know. I would love to see that. So if you're an amateur ast- astronomer or just somebody who likes to look up, uh, get ready for August 21st. It's going to be a really cool time. The whole time you were talking about that, I couldn't help but think about, you remember on the movie The Hangover when the Dan band starts singing Total Eclipse of the Heart? <laughs> yeah. That's all I could think of the whole time. Was <laughs> Whatever like, happened to the Dan man, band? They're still, man... Uh, it's it's funny you bring that up because when I'm thinking about the whole Dan Band thing, I just punched in Dan Band. They're playing here at the end of the month. Are they really? They're over at Dallas. Yeah, I'd like the book house for my blues. wedding. Right? <laughs> if I was to have another wedding, <laughs> I would love that. Yeah, we need to have the Dan Band, folks. I'm going to get into this right quick here. Uh, this comes, of course, from our, our home Elon Strickler over there at Phantoms and Monsters. He posted this up, and this is something that's really interesting. And I want to share this because it's not like anything we've we've even touched on. It's called the Crow Man. And he writes that it's the host of an Italian paranormal YouTube channel called The Theory of Truth. And he spoke about this creature encounter back in the summer of 2011. Now, some of it was changed a little bit of the dialogue because it was broken English. So this is what's written. This is what Lon posted. It says, I'm here to tell you about a story, probably the most scary or terrifying story ever in my life. It happened about six years ago in the summer of 2011. One night, as has happened many times, I was coming home late a late night, about midnight or 1 a.m. in my car. I want to say that I never use drugs and that I never smoke, so my mind is always very clear, always. At the time, I had come back to my car and I was parking. When I left my car, I felt very, like, strange. I felt very cold in my body, but it was summer. It was a July, so it was very warm weather. But I felt very cold, especially in my chest and in my stomach. And I felt like there was something pressing on my chest. I had extremely strong feelings that something or someone was watching me. So that was the first night. But this thing, this kind of thing, has happened to me at different times in my life. So I didn't really care. I just went home to sleep. This particular event repeated the next day and then the next day. Every day, the presentation became stronger and scarier. It repeated for about one week. At day four or five, I don't really remember, these feelings became much stronger. And also, along with these feelings, there was another scary thing. I was hearing a noise that was like, it's hard to describe, I don't know, footsteps. Heavy footsteps of a great animal or man. Anyway, so that day I was very scared. These things happened the next day again. It was the sixth day of this particular event. Then the seventh day, same as the night before, I go out and I come back to my home with my car and I park. I got out of my car, closed the door. I had very strong feelings and I felt very cold, but in a way that I've never felt before in my life. Now... I was scared because I knew at the time that someone was watching me. So I decided to stay and to not go to the house, but to stay and try to understand what was happening to see if there really was someone or something that was watching me. I heard again and again these footsteps and they were so very heavy. So I stayed and I watched around the courtyard. I looked around and finally see a scary sight. I see a creature. I see this big shadow, black shadow. And it was very big and very tall because I'm six foot four inches. And this shape, it looks much taller than me. The most scary thing was that it was not a shadow. But it's the big red eyes that this shadow had. They were very big and very shiny, and they were watching me. 
And at that time, I was very scared. I didn't know what to do. Do I run? Do I run to the shadow? I just stood there, paralyzed for some seconds. I didn't know what to do. Now this thing starts to walk towards me. And after probably three or four seconds, it's almost to me. It was about 10 meters away. And I snapped out of it. I was terrified and I ran. I don't know why, but I ran over and behind the wall by my house. And I closed the gate of my garden. And then I ran into my house. In my house, the door is a full glass door. So you can see right out. And when I closed the door, I saw out through the gate and I see the eyes. They were near my gate. They were still watching me. It was very, very terrifying. And still now, when I talk about it, I still get terrified. So in that moment, I was so scared that I go into the other room for probably five minutes. And after I look out the door, the eyes in the shadow, they're not there. I went out to see, but since that moment, I've never seen this creature again. I don't know what it was. But I do know it was real because I saw it for several seconds and I saw the eyes and I remember still the shape of this shadow and its eyes and the noise of its steps. And I've talked about this with only a few friends and family. And a month after these strange things happened to me, I saw on the web creatures that were similar. In the world, there were many over these years encounters with these creatures that were said to be mothmen. When I saw this picture of this creature, it was really like I had seen one of those. So I don't know if it was a mothman. But at the time when I saw it, the first time, I called it the crow man. Because it was like a big crow with a big black shadow and the eyes. Also searched if they were animals, any real animals that had red eyes at night. The fox has the red eyes in the dark. <laughs> And I don't believe a fox could exist that was as tall or taller than me and that it could step with two feet like a man. And the eyes were very big, so I don't know what it really was. But every time I tell my friends or people I know about this story, I tell them that it was the only time in my life that I was really that scared and it was so very real. So what do you think about that, Philly? Man. That is terrifying. That is terrifying, right? And I tell yeah. everybody this, folks. I want to touch on that because of who we are going to talk to after the break. We had the the great luck to have our friend, Mr. Lon Strickler, the man behind Phantoms and Monsters, the blog that we always talk about. He's one of the hosts of Arcane Radio, another podcast you can tune in and listen to and download and check out. But we had him come on because of all the new Mothman sightings in Chicago, the things that have been going on. We also had him talk about some of the Dogman sightings. Yeah. But this Crow Man sighting is what I wanted to lead into because Lon does a great job. He talks about a lot of the sightings, a lot of the strange things, the stuff that's going on. We just had Seth on. They're talking about his movie. This is just something that kind of goes hand in hand because it seems to be flaring back up again in certain areas it's a very interesting interview we had a wonderful time talking to lawn i hope y'all enjoyed as much as we did doing it so let's take a quick break and when we come back we're gonna be sitting down with mr lawn strickler of phantoms and monsters thank you so much folks and you're listening to expanded perspectives And folks, I got something I got to talk to y'all about. It's one of today's sponsors, and it's something that I do truly love, and I do truly use just about every day. And I'm looking across the table over at my bread, and I can tell he's been using it because he's looking mighty well-groomed. I have. I actually shaved my mustache <laughs> off. I've had a goatee for a couple of years now. I shaved the mustache off, and little Luke, my five-year-old, came out the other day and was like, oh, what happened to your mustache? It fell off. <laughs> That's right. And then he was like, don't worry, Daddy. You can put it on tomorrow. And I was <laughs> like, can, all right. Yeah. But yeah, man, I've been using this product, and I love it. This is one of my favorite things. 
really, I can't even, I can't talk about it enough, folks. And what I'm talking about is Dollar Shave Club. And it's, it's, look, it's crazy. Like I know, and like I said before, I know y'all see me in my big beard, but I do shave my head. It's something that I've always done for the longest time. And this is the greatest thing. Not only is it the greatest thing, it's the smartest choice to make. Kyle and I had a discussion about this a while back. And we were talking about one of the, the probably the most popular razors you can talk about is like this Gillette Pro Glide razor. So we look it all up. Well, you can get one less blade and pay twice as much money, basically. That's it. You're going to be able to get a heck of a deal. A great shave, a great price, convenience, the smartest thing you can do. No gimmicks, no nothing. This is what you get, folks. For a limited time, the new members, the members we're going to give you this code for, you're going to get your very first month of, get this, not the intro, not the mid, the top, the executive razor package. You're going to get that. And a tube of Dr. Carver's shave butter, which is awesome. I love the shave butter. The shave butter is awesome. You're going to get all of that for your very first month for five bucks and free shipping. Now, after that, the executive pack is $9 a month. That's it. And the shipping's free. So it goes up four bucks, boom. You just keep getting them and you just keep rolling them in. And look, you can use them. I shave my head with them every other day. You can't dull these things down. It is awesome. I love it. That's I right. mean, I really do love it. And if you don't want the executive, you could step down and get the four blade, which is called the 4X, and it's only six dollars a yes. month with free shipping. Yes. And then if you want the Humble Twin, which is a two blade razor, it's a dollar a month. Now, you do have to pay shipping, but the shipping is $2. So basically $3 a month. Yeah. It's an incredible deal. It is a heck I of love a it. deal. And I know y'all are right now going, well, well what's, what's the code, man? What's the code? If you go to dollarshaveclub.com slash expanded, that's where you're going to get it, folks. dollarshaveclub.com slash expanded. And I'm going to tell you right now, go ahead and load up on the shave butter. You don't want to use that silly cream anymore, the foam, a bar of soap. Get rid of that crud. You don't want that. The shave butter is where it's at. It's the butter, and it's where it's at, and it's perfect. This is great. It's the smartest thing you can do, the smartest choice you can make when it comes to personal hygiene if you like to shave. Ladies, for your legs, every, your armpits, everything, ladies, you can jump on this just as fast. Go to, to dollarshaveclub.com slash expanded and get your first month for only five bucks. All right, it is time. And as most of y'all know, and that have listened, a couple of weeks ago, we had Seth Breedlove come on, and we were discussing his Mothman movie. Well, then, of course, that got Kyle and I's wheels turning, and we thought, well, who can we talk to about more Mothman things that's going on right now? And there's only one man that comes to, to mind. And that's it's right. The king uh, uh, of the Phantoms and Monsters world, Mr. Lon Strickler, and he's here with us. Lon, how you doing, man? Hey, how you? Man, I'm excited. I am too. I'm really excited to get to have you come on. We've listened to you on Arcane Radio. We've read all the blogs. We keep up with your books, with all the stuff that's going on. Like we were discussing right before we started recording how busy you've been, is this is no rest for the wicked type feeling, is you've been in the grind for a while now. Yeah, I've been, well, you know, overall, I've been doing this since the late 70s. God, that's so, incredible. Yeah. Yeah, And then this, and, and like we said, that's why we wanted to get you on is because I remember, and when I say I remember, I want to say it was back in early part of April, I think I remember you posted something about a Mothman-like creature or something that somebody had an encounter in Chicago. And mm -hmm. then this seems to have escalated because we've been keeping up with it because I want to say it was towards like the middle of the end of, of April, <laughs> around April 18th or 20th somewhere. You had reposted again where somebody had had something else happen and it just kept building and building. So can you, since we're on the Mothman kick, so we're going to turn it over to you and let you kind of talk about what's been going on. Okay. Well, back in, uh, actually this, this first sighting, now, first of all, let me preface this by saying back in 2011, there were three sightings in and around Chicago uh, of this bat-like looking creature uh, people were talking about. And um, 
you know, there was there was a picture that that surfaced. Uh, it looked like well, it looked like a it looked like a large bat. I mean, it, it was hard to gauge how big this thing was, but it was it was fairly good size. So there were about three reports of that that I know of. <clears throat> so, excuse me. So I um. So you know that kind of was dragging on for a couple of years now, but then this. Uh, this past uh, April, I'm mean, about I guess about four weeks ago. A friend of mine in Chicago got a hold of him. His name's Emmanuel Navarrete. He uh, runs the UFO Clearinghouse website, and he told me, "See, you know, I got this weird Mothman-like sighting reported to me by a woman out by Oz Park in Chicago." And um, he said, "You, you know, when I get get the report made up, you want to, um, you want to post." I said, "Sure," and I posted things before for him, but it, you know, it wasn't anything like this. So, this sighting was on uh, April seventh of this year in Oz Park, Chicago, and this woman reported that uh, she's seen a large humanoid, probably seven foot or taller standing on the ground and in this park um he said it was solid black he, she said but what really stood out were the large pair of wings that were folded behind it now these wings actually stood taller than the humanoid by at least a foot or more and jutted out of its back now she said she couldn't see the face at first but when it turned she didn't Notice that it had bright ruby eyes, ruby red eyes that appeared to glow with them in within from within. And uh, she said she was w- watched it for a couple seconds, and this thing just kind of shot straight up in the air. Uh, you know, she saw it as after it got up in the air a bit, and uh, it was uh, the wings were were. Uh, were unfolded and it was it was basically flying and flapping about and it took off so she um now this was this was during the day i, mean, I guess this is in the uh the late afternoon so she um you know she had reported this to manuel he didn't know you know she didn't know what it was i i don't think she ever had any idea of anything about a mothman or a flying humanoid but she found him online and she sent the report into him. So he did get, he did get an interview with her a little bit later and she verified everything. So, um, you know, I posted it and, and just didn't figure we were going to get any more reports. Mm-hmm. I mean, I thought it was just a one time thing, right? But a couple, about a week later on, um, four fifteen, April 15th, a report came into MUFON about a huge owl-like humanoid with bright yellow-red eyes. And this was seen at the Chicago International Produce Market, uh, which is located right in uh, about South Philly. I mean, excuse me, Philly, South Chicago. And uh, this was about 2 o'clock in the morning. Uh, a gentleman said he was coming into work. Uh, they, he starts early. He said he came, you know, he was walking in from the parking lot and he saw these guys out in the parking lot looking up at this thing. <laughs> and he said, he said it was completely black except for it having bright yellow reddish eyes like a cat. He said it stood there for a minute or two staring at everyone before shooting up into the sky and disappearing. Uh, he said it made everyone feel uneasy and only took off after some guy threw a rock at it. Uh, it had wings like an owl, only bigger, and you could hear it flap its wings when it took off. Now, we're attempting to get some of the wit- one or at least one of those witnesses to talk to us. Um, you know, of course, since it came through MUFON, we had no way of finding out. Though, just the other day, I got a, um, I got a call from the MUFON state director in Illinois. And they're going to be going out and starting to talk to some of the witnesses. So hopefully, I mean, they, they promised to share some of the information. So maybe this will be a mutual thing and we can, you know, get some more information on what's going on. Well, anyway, 
so it's starting to get interesting now. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, <laughs> on, uh, then another report came in a couple of days later on, uh, the 16th of April out of Humboldt park in Chicago. And again, we had multiple witnesses. They said it was an owl like humanoid it stood on two feet and looked right at the witnesses. Uh, they said it looked like a huge lacusa, which is, uh, Spanish for barn owl. And except it was about six foot tall and it had large glowing red eyes. Now I'm assuming this is in a Hispanic neighborhood and, uh, you know, I don't know if you know anything about the lacusa, but there's a, you know, it's supposedly a cryptid from the, uh, Rio Grande Valley, Northern Mexico, Southern Texas. Huge barn owl that's that's seen down there. So um, so that was that came through Mufon as well. So then the next one was uh, actually reported actually occurred the day before this last sighting on the fifteenth of April, uh, but it wasn't reported till a day later. And um, this also came in through Mufon. And this was at Montrose, close to Montrose Beach, but it was out in uh, Lake Michigan. Uh, again, we had multiple witnesses that were in a boat. And they said the bat-like flying humanoid, six to seven foot in length. It was solid black with eyes that seemed to reflect the moonlight. Now, it was like, of course, it was night out. And uh, I, I don't remember what the time was, but... Uh, I do know right after this thing flew off, there was a UFO sighting as well, a green orb UFO across the horizon. So, you know, I don't know if that's anything that's, you know, related to this, but it's just something to note. So, after, so, you know, of course, we were wondering what's been going on. Then we started wondering what's going on. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, uh, you know, Manuel's out there looking. I've got other people. Now looking into this and, uh, you know, hopefully we were going to get some more, you know, more sighting. So on the 27th of April, and I think the report came in the day after that, Manuel got another report at UFO Clearinghouse uh, at the Little Calumet River, which is near East 130th Street in Chicago. Um, man and his son were fishing and they described a solid black a uh, full grown man that had wings, but it kind of reminded them of a bat. They said it had to be from 10 foot from tip to tip, flew up and out of sight within seconds. He called it a bat, literally a bat out of hell. And it was uh, on the other side of the river. He said the sound that attracted their attention to it was that it made it sound like train brakes when the train's slowing down. The screeching, huh? Yeah. So, uh, I don't know what, if it was, if it was making an audible sound, you know, uh, or it was the wings. I don't know what it was, but, um, you know, now this was a bat. Now this, you know, we, the last two then that that's, um, the one before that, and this, and we're then this one were, uh, described as bats. So two days ago, I got another report from Manuel, another one, uh, and, What's that again? Another one? Yeah, this last one, uh, which was seen on May 5th. Uh, it was eight at 8 p.m. at Calumet Park in Chicago, which is south, uh, south Chicago. The last two were in South Chicago. And this is a, a law enforcement officer. Uh, actually, it was a state police officer and his son. They were in the park, and they witnessed this flying humanoid about six foot in height and uh blackish grayish in color had an enormous pair of wings that must have been eight to ten foot across and he said when this thing flew over them towards the area of the field house in this park uh other he heard other people screaming because they had seen it so uh that's the last that's the last report we got Man, this seems to be like a new wave. I mean, you know, a large wave. The last time I think this happened was what, nineteen sixty six to nineteen sixty seven? Yeah, this I, I believe this is probably the, the largest group of sightings 
of this type of flying humanoid since Point Pleasant. Wow. So maybe yeah. something really bad is about to happen in Chicago, or Seth Breedlove is a master marketer of his new movie that's about to come out. <laughs> well, you know, I tell you, I, I talked to Seth the other day. Uh, he was at he was out in Western Pennsylvania with me, and uh, he and I were talking about these uh, some of these um, articles that had been coming out, basically saying that he was running a viral campaign. And he was frustrated. He's frustrated by it, and I can, I can, I can understand that. Yeah. Uh, but I mean, no, uh, he, you know, I know Seth a while, and he's an upstanding guy. And there's no way he he had even tried to do this. You know, he doesn't even have the budget to do this. <laughs> so, and the and, Cubs and won the World Series. Chicago, well, well, you know. But this is I, on the South Side, so point. that's the White Sox territory. Yeah, <laughs> that's why. Yeah. <laughs> well, the Cubs winning the World Series opened up the gates to hell, and this stuff <laughs> yeah. decided to come out. <laughs> I can't imagine. Well, I'm sure when you got the first report, you didn't expect at all for there to be more. And yeah, that's one of those I things. Mean, that, I didn't expect it at all. I mean, yeah. I, it, it's nice to get a report. I mean, every once in a while, we'll get a flying human or report of some type. Uh, you know, I've been dealing with for years these um, these flying manta ray shaped beings. Uh, I, which I believe is some type of bioengineered UFO. Some I don't know what they are, but they're they're shaped like manta rays, and they come in all sizes. And you know, but people have been seeing those all over the place for for years now, mostly in the eastern part of the United States. And uh, you know, you'll get these these pterodon, pterosaur sightings, you know, thunderbird sightings, and uh, but of course, you know, every once in a while, you're going to get one of these Mothman like beings seen somewhere and um but you know the first one came up in chicago and i got all excited because i remember the sightings from 2011 so of course i'm hoping well maybe we're going to get something else but i doubt it but then but then they came and now we've got six sightings now within a four-week period that's incredible yeah that i don't even know but you do think that you're going to be able to actually personally speak to some of these uh witnesses but Manuel's talked to two of them already. Nice. Nice. Yeah, so uh, hopefully somebody's going to be quick enough to get a picture of one of these things. So um, that would be uh, that would be nice. It's funny where they're seeing them is just kind of in random spots. You know, it's not like it's dedicated to one park area or something where you could almost <laughs> justify something going on there. It's in random areas through there. So it's it's hit or miss like an animal would be. Yeah, I've got a map. Um, I've got a map of the location. So if you go to the blog, you, if you scroll down, you'll have the map. I have the map there. Yeah, yes. And, uh, it's um, but it's all within you know all within the city limits. So um, you know it's um, I haven't heard anything from you know in the suburbs or anything. But uh, and no real interaction, like aside from the woman seeing it and it mm -hmm. she's seeing the answer. There's been no real like physical interaction like it's swooping down at people or anything like that yet no no it hasn't yet yeah, let's hope it doesn't come to that either <laughs> yeah i mean uh you know if you look at all the reports from way back in you know in and around point pleasant very few of them uh seem to interact with the witness except the, those at first near the tnt area mm -hmm. this thing seemed to swoop swoop in on people and of course the one sighting inside one of the uh, plants. Uh, but other than that, most of them stayed fairly far away from people. I, I can't wait to see where this goes. It's really one of those things that more people should be paying attention to it because it's like this is an ongoing thing that's happening in our time that we get to be part of as far as keeping mm -hmm. up with it. And like you said, I can only hope that one day maybe somebody's quick enough to get a picture of it, to pull it yeah. up and go yeah. with it. Yeah, I agree. I mean, that's what I'm hoping for. And, um, uh, you know, I've got my, you know, I'm checking, <laughs> I'm checking a move on CMS about four or five times a day. And once, as soon as one comes up, I'm going to have it up there. And of course, Manuel's been taking reports. So if, you know, I'm trying to get the word out there. If anybody else gets a report to let me know about it so I can get it up on the, uh, on the database. But, uh, yeah, this is, uh, this is a biggie. And, uh, and of course, with MUFON being interested in sharing information, and uh, that's 
that's unusual for them. So yeah, they're, um, they're really interested in it now too. So we'll have to wait and see what happens with it. Oh, I can't wait. I Man. can't wait to see what you do. Also too, a lot of people may not know, you know, like we've turned to you from Mothman, but we also wanted to turn to you because everybody seems to have a new addiction when it comes to cryptids and unknown uh, upright canids is you're the man that goes in with this, this Pennsylvania lichen investigation. You've been a big part of keeping up with this stuff, too. Yeah, this all started uh, back in, I think, 2015. Where you know I've been working with a gentleman by the name of Butch Witkowski. He and I've been working together for about four or five years on this Todd C's case, which happened back in 2002 in uh, Northumberland, PA. And uh, you know, so we've been taking cryptid reports as well and looking into it. Well, we we can the first report we got was. Uh, in uh, no, November 7th, we actually received a report uh, from an incident that happened in um, in the state game land 331, which is near Penfield, Pennsylvania, in Clearfield County. And this gentleman had seen an 8 to 10 foot tall unknown creature uh, simply come out of the blue i mean it just appeared you know and this guy has two dogs with the dogs going nuts but this thing uh it had a snout like a canine and it it just showed up and was walking away from them and acted like it didn't even know they were there and just kept on going and uh freaked him out of course and you know a day later they um he came back into the state game line with uh a couple of buddies with some, you know, they were armed. They were ready for this thing. Mm-hmm. But the interesting thing was when they got to the point where he had seen it, they all spooked. And I don't know why. Um, it's like they had this sense of dread. And they just turned on a dime and headed out of there. And quite frankly, the guy really didn't want to talk about it much more than that. Which was, you know, kind of interesting. And I tell you, Clearfield's an area... Clearfield County is an area where Pennsylvania Bigfoot Society has had lots of Bigfoot sightings. They, they actually have a study area uh, in there in Rockton or near Rockton. So we, we've had a lot of strange phenomena reported in that, you know, up in Clearfield. But it, what, what was interesting this with this was not long after that, I posted this story. I had posted this sighting. And I got a, I got a letter from a gentleman that uh, wanted to make a report of something he had seen in mid-August of 2015, uh, and this was also near Penfield. And he said he was uh, he was driving home from work. I guess it was I don't know around three o'clock in the afternoon or so. And as he was his, he was driving down this road. Uh, just west of Penfield, he said he came up to something that was crouched by the side of the road. He didn't know what it was until it turned and looked at him. And first thing he thought was werewolf. He said it had a large head with a yellow glow in its eyes and a long nose. He said, I went around this thing and it just watched me as I went. He said it was eating a deer, eating roadkill. And, uh, he hit, he hit the gas and got out of there. He freaked out. He actually said it was so bad. He went into the basement when he got home and was just <laughs> sitting there shaking. So, um, the, the, and the strange thing, and, you know, the strange thing about this was he said he hadn't seen anything after that, but he said about a month after that, not long at, not long before he contacted me. He said he was at a local mini mart getting gasoline. And he said a game commission officer pulled up next to, to the pump and he said attached to the truck was a trailer. And in the trailer was a, uh, a young male elk. And he said a lot of the elks have radio collars and one dies. The, the game commission's job to figure out how it died, where it died, and to pick up the carcass. Well, 
he said he, he looked at this um this elk and it had his throat slit and he said the he asked the officer about it. he said yeah he said the um he said they had no clue what happened but they said what was interesting was the collar that had been on this elk was missing and then found about i think it was about 10 foot away from the the uh Yelk and it it was you know it was a thick uh leather collar that was slit like a knife went through it wow so it slit this collar and the throat of this elk and this thing bled out now it, you know it, nothing, it wasn't anything it wasn't chewed on or anything and there's no way a, a bear could do that i mean a bear just doesn't have its claws just aren't that sharp mm-hmm. so uh of course that kind of got him thinking and uh so you know this is um that was the second sighting we got then we started getting sightings you know i'm putting this thing up stuff on the blog and we're starting to get more sightings we had one in cambria county uh near uptown park in portage pennsylvania and it turns out when the investigator uh went there to ask people about this went to the first witness she ended up getting two other witness reports of people that had seen this thing of course this was a uh, uh they had seen the legs of a they didn't know what it was some type of humanoid but it was it was uh it the feet looked like large claws but it was flat flat footed on two legs and um the strange thing about it was when people would walk their dogs in this park they would you know the people would see this thing behind the sign or back in the bushes and they'd see the legs but the dogs never reacted to it so what that was strange so uh of course uh, when they were talking to these people then another witness came forward while they were talking to them and telling them that you know this neighborhood used to have cats everywhere you know it was just cats all over were the place feral cats mm-hmm. and that the cats were missing they were they were all gone hmm. so something was feeding on something so um you know that was the third fourth fifth report of whatever we got then we had a not long later we got a report out of blair county which on something that had happened in march of 2013 and these are two gentlemen from altoona that had uh had seen one on the side of the road late at night eating on some roadkill. And this one was kind of odd. And this, this report was really interesting because the way it was described, it was almost like it was had a supernatural look to it. It had a sheen, like a, an aura around it. And it had, of course, the yellow eyes, but it was really bizarre. And uh, <clears throat> so, you know, after that, we had a... Uh, we had another sighting in Misho State Park in Cumberland, Pennsylvania, uh, which is an area that's well known for Bigfoot sightings. And, you know, it's been going on from there. And at this point in time, now the last, the last report I got was an old report. But, you know, we've got old reports, new reports. But right now we've got altogether a total of about 22 solid reports in that period. <sighs> That is, it's so crazy. I can't even wrap my head around I know. that many of them in one area. And it seems like the frequency <laughs> of the sightings is increasing. Like, I don't remember even hardly reading about a dog man sighting, you know, seven years ago. And it now, it just seems like more and more people are seeing them or, or more people are aware of them. So they're able to discern the difference between a dog man and, you know, a Sasquatch or something. It does seem like it's increasing, though, right? And not just in Pennsylvania, but all over, including Canada, uh, yeah, Oklahoma, yeah, we, uh, everywhere. Right before this, these sightings in Pennsylvania started, uh, uh, Linda Godfrey and I were noticing that we were getting sightings up in, in southern Ontario and in Manitoba. She had had a couple sightings in Manitoba. I had had three real good reports around the Niagara Falls area. And, um, they were fairly close together. And then not let, not long after that, then we started getting these reports in Pennsylvania. Now 
these these upright canines that we have been getting reports for, you know, the bunch that and this extends from uh, Clearfield County, Pennsylvania, which is north central PA, south east into York and Lancaster County. We call it the Lichen Loop because all of these these sightings are of uh, bipedal upright canines. Now, the stereotypical dogman are, are quadrupeds. We have received some other sightings in Pennsylvania and, and neighboring states of these dogmen. They're large like quadrupeds with a large head, large wolf-like head, but they've kind of got a sloping back like a, uh, like a hyena. Wow. Now, the, the dogman upright canine sightings, uh, there has there is a historical tradition to these things. Uh, down in Maryland, uh, in Frederick County, from the Pennsylvania line south into Frederick and a little further west, there were there are some have been historical sightings of what they call the Dwayo. Um, some of those were back in the uh, late eighteen hundreds. And described by some of the um, the uh, Pennsylvania Dutch or German immigrants who who actually settled down into Maryland, and the last sightings were in the uh, late '60s. And I actually talked to one of the, a gentleman who was uh, who sighted who saw one of these in in near Middletown, Maryland. So. No, there is a history of these, but the fact that we're getting this flap uh, at this time is kind of odd. And, you know, the, one of the interesting aspects of this is the, the Bigfoot sightings in Pennsylvania in general. And we were talking about this at the, uh, at the Pennsylvania Bigfoot uh, camping adventure this past weekend out in Fayette County. Many of us were talking about this because in the past year and a half, two years, the Bigfoot sightings have really dropped, you know, the number of sightings. Mm -hmm. Now, I don't know if this has anything to do with the, uh, the dog man or upright canine sightings. I'm not sure, but the, uh, the Bigfoot sightings have really waned. Like the dog man moved in and they moved out. Well, I don't know if that's what, what it is, but it, 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 you know, it's just, Odd. I'm, I'm just noting that, but that's it. Does seem kind of weird. It does, yeah. It yeah. does seem something, or it's almost like <clears throat> one is a bit more of uh, of a, like a a predator than maybe the other. Yeah, and it, the interesting part about some of these sightings or some of these encounters that people have with this dog man is now they they don't attack, but they hold their ground. They're not running off. Mm -hmm. You know, not like a bigfoot. A bigfoot. You know, he gets one whiff of you. You're, he's gone. Uh, and in fact, it, he'll sit there and look at you, stand there and look at you like he can understand why you see him. You know, they kind of get that reaction and they take off. But these, um, in fact, some of these, at least one of these sightings, uh, which was in Blair County, we've had two or three sightings in Blair County. One of these sightings was in, in the state game land and the gentleman had a shotgun with him. And he walked up onto this this upright canine, and he didn't bother taking a shot at it. He backed away. I mean, he you know this thing was so menacing. He, I guess, he figured that you know if, he's just going to start trouble taking a shot at this. <laughs> exactly. You know, you never know what's going to happen if you shoot no. one. <laughs> well, you're seeing something you, know, you, you can't you, fathom. You heard people talk about that in the past too. That they'll take a shot at a bigfoot, and it's like this thing went right through him and didn't even bother him. Yeah. Yeah. So if you're seeing something you can't wrap your head around, uh, you understand you're like, well, what if I shoot it and it doesn't do anything to it? It just aggravates it. Now I'm wearing this werewolf on top of me at that point. You're like, I can yeah, understand. Well, yeah, you got to also think <laughs> some people, and in particular with Bigfoot, I mean, they, you know, the, the first thing you think about, well, is this actually something other than human? Mm -hmm. I don't want to shoot a human. And, uh, you know, I, I think people kind of get that as far as these upright canines too. I mean, they, first of all, you can't understand why this thing is standing <laughs> on That's two true. legs. Yes. Yeah. 
So I, I don't know. Uh, but, it, you know, th they do stand their ground. That is one aspect of these these uh, these beings that is pretty consistent. The, now, the, the sighting or the encounter that happened in Misho State Park, uh, which was uh, back in early 2016, uh, the, the woman said that they heard this thing. They had a cabin. They heard this thing outside the cabin at night. And she said she went out in the morning and she just caught a glimpse of this thing jumping out of a bush running towards her. And she got in the cabin before it caught her. Oh, man. Uh, so I don't know. She, she, you know, she really wasn't sure what it was. But the way this thing moved and the way it acted, I don't think it was a Bigfoot. Well, and, and you had brought up before we right before we started discussing this about Todd C.'s death. And mm -hmm. are they still looking into that? Like, or is it still an ongoing thing? Like, I know y'all are investigating it, but is it one of those things? Because there's really no answer. I know that what they tried to give the answer for it, but it doesn't seem like that's even remotely close to it. Yeah. Could you tell the people about the Todd C.'s case? Isn't that the one where he was going hunting on his four-wheeler and then just never came home? And they found his clothes well, on the top of trees yeah, or something? What happened with that was he... um. He lived in the uh, on near the Montour Ridge, um, which is just north of uh, hunting. Excuse me, of uh, Northumberland, Pennsylvania. And this was all his land, and he he went up the trail on his four uh, four wheeler to scout uh, for deer, which was early in the morning. Now mm -hmm. uh, it was kind of you know it was in the summertime, so I don't know what he was really looking for. Uh, he wasn't armed or anything, but he, um, you know, he told, he told his wife, I suppose that he'd be back at so-and-so time. And this was like six in the morning and by noon he wasn't back. So they knew something was going on. So, um, you know, she put out the call, they, you know, the, for, uh, I guess she called the authorities, told him that, you know, he didn't show up. Something must have happened to the guy. Uh, it's an area that's got a heavy concentration, a heavy population of timber ratters. So, you know, first thing you think is, well, maybe he got bit and couldn't make himself way back or whatever. But, mm -hmm. you know, they, they, what happened was uh, there was a massive search that ensued. Uh, actually, there were about 200 plus volunteers search dogs, helicopters, state, local police. It was a well-organized day. You even had, even had divers and because they had a pond there, which was about 70 foot from the house. They checked everything, everything there and nothing showed up. So about 36 hours later, uh, one of his family members looked out was I guess coming out of the house or looking out the window or something and saw something white laying in the bushes by the pond. Now this is an area that was searched heavily searched. They had cadaver dogs and everything out. And he went out there and there's Todd C's laying there by the pond. Mm, wow. Right there. Yep. So um you know, there were searchers out there at the time. So this guy, you know, con got a hold of somebody. They nobody touched the body until the coroner was called. They they gathered up all the searchers, all the people that were participating, took them to a local firehouse, and basically locked them in. I, you know, this is this this was really strange. <laughs> basically locked them in. Uh, and we're debriefing these people. It was, they, they were said to have these guys in, in suits come in there and tell them not to speak a word of what happened. You know, you know, don't, there's going to be press, but don't, you know, utter a word and people, I mean, they basically read them the riot act and they scared them. And, uh, you know, people were saying, well, it was the FBI or something. I believe it was air force intelligence i believe it was air force military um investigators and um and this was all because that when he when he disappeared 
there were two fairly reliable sightings of a large disc craft that was hovering above the top of Montour Ridge above the power line. And, uh, one of the witnesses, it was two guys, but they were together. They noticed something being beamed up to the craft and they said it looked like a man in his underwear. Wow. And that's the only way that you could explain how the body just reappears where well, it's Well, you know, that's the speculation. That's yeah. the thought. Um, you know, right off the bat, this was this uh, incident was being covered up by uh, the authorities. Um, they finally ruled the death as a fatal cocaine toxicity. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah. You know, this guy just, you know, this guy just shows up, you know. So there was some, there was some decomp on the guy, uh, on Mr. C's, but the body itself had no blood left in. I mean, the blood was gone when they did the autopsy. We were able to get the, the actual full autopsy report. Uh, Butch was able to get it through, um, contacting, uh, the, um, the lab that did the actual, uh, toxicity plus the autopsy. They, um, we got the full report. Well, with the amount of cocaine and degraded cocaine that was found in this guy's body, there wasn't any way he was coming down that hill on himself, you know, by himself. Mm -hmm. I mean, it was enough. It was enough to kill an elephant. As far as I'm concerned, this guy would have dropped right dead, dead right there. So he wasn't walking down, you know, down the hill, this rocky hill where all these rattlesnakes and everything by himself. So, you know, something, I believe something dropped in there. And, um, you know, frankly, we haven't made any de a determination of what happened as of yet. We're, you know, we're still hoping for more evidence and, you know, we've been eventually getting evidence. We've got, um, you know, we're planning on going up there sometime soon again and going through a few things and trying to find more witnesses. And we have had some people serve us lately who we need to talk to, but at this point, with the evidence that we do have, uh, we are saying that there is a greater than 50% chance that this was some type of abduction. Oh, wow. Did they ever, did they ever recover his four wheeler? Yeah. Oh, yeah. That was that. up there on top of the hill. Okay. Wow. That is, man, that is a strange case. I mean, if it was just a, a accidental overdose on cocaine, why would, you know, the government guys be showing up and telling people not to talk about it? I mean, there's overdose cases all the time. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, the family wasn't even allowed to look at the body. They they were giving a given a casket like box that was sealed, welded shut. Wow. Yeah, they weren't even. They were told, you know, here's the body. That, you know, they couldn't tell what was in it, and you know, they buried it at a certain location. And, you know, we've been to the burial site, you know, it's got a marker and everything, but quite frankly, I don't believe there's anything there. It may just be just a box. I don't even think anything was put in there. I don't think anything's there. Wow. We, um, we actually, well, we didn't do it, but somebody we know did it took a, uh, took a probe and put down into the grave and it never hit anything. Wow, that's interesting. Yeah, thin, put a thin probe down, and I don't know how many feet it went, but it definitely went beyond six foot. And, um, you know, in, in certain different places, and it never hit a thing. Man. And so, you know, that's something else we we discovered as well. So, um, it's, it's and that, well, and then there's another thing, too, and this is strange. Uh, the year before last, one of his nephews, uh, who had been quite outspoken online about us and others looking into his uncle's death, died unexpectedly in a, in a crash. And we were looking, he, he had just graduated from high school too. And we were looking into the thing, uh, into the, the case itself. And, there's a lot of questions about that too, because the, you know, I don't have the full particulars on it yet, but 
you know, you cannot, we, we haven't been able to get any information from the state police on this crash other than he ran head on into a track trailer. Wow. That is strange. <clears throat> yeah. There's, 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 a, there's other factors to this thing that we just haven't be able to, been able to get. And, um, you know, if we ever get a chance, believe me, because we're working on all this other stuff now. We've got another location. We got a location in northern uh, Lancaster County where we frankly don't know what's going on. Uh, a lot of strange anomalies are showing up. Uh, some UFO activity, but uh, we are getting these glassine-like figures that are showing up um, at a location, old farm. You know, you know, if you ever seen the movie Predator, uh, you know, the, the glassine like cloaking that this the predator alien had gone had gone through would uh morph into uh Yeah. We're getting yeah, we're getting uh that as well. So this is another location we're looking into. We've been working on this a couple of months and we've actually had an, a remote view done by uh, a colleague of mine in it's basically more questions than answers right at this point. So that's another thing we're looking into. Well, Butch and I have been pretty busy. It sounds like it. I mean, <laughs> yeah. I don't know. I mean, you, you post something, several stories every day. I mean, you must be getting <clears throat> flooded with sightings. But I have to ask you, Lon, you've been doing this for a long time. Of all the craziness that gets sent to you, is there mm -hmm. one particular that you like the best? What's your favorite? I think it's probably one of my encounters with the... Um, the Conawaga phantom thing, the, uh, that, uh, that creature that kind of reminds you of a mothman. And, uh, you know, that's probably one of the strangest. And, you know, I'm not the only one that saw this thing. This was, uh, this was another mothman like creature in, uh, South central Pennsylvania along the Conawaga Creek. And it's been seen six times now, uh, within a 20 year period. So, uh, you know, that's something else. So when did you see this? And can you tell us I about that it, encounter? I saw it in 1988 and, uh, it, it was, it was fairly interesting because I, I had a friend of mine I used to go to school with run into me when I was living down in Baltimore and they were telling me about this. And, um, what happened was the, um, you know, this was a boy scout like meeting, you know, down in Timonium. So they were down there for that. And we got to talk and, and, you know, he knew I was into the paranormal and a lot of other things. And, uh, he had known about my Bigfoot sighting in 81 and such. So he asked me, you know, he said, you know, I, I wanted to mention something to you. He said, we were down at Camp Conewago. And, um, he said that a few of the local troops had been at the, uh, the, at the old at the old campsite and some of the re boys had reported hearing crying sounds and were spooked bad enough that they, they had left their campsites early <clears throat> so he said that they were going to look into it you know they weren't really they said they weren't expecting much but it, it was happening and it happened more than one time now i don't think they had seen anything but they were um you know they were hearing these strange things and the boys were getting scared and stuff so they were they were taken off. So, uh, my friend Andy and John and his friend, John, uh, you know, they asked me, said, you know, you know, if you'd come up, we're going to spend the weekend up there next weekend up there. Uh, do you want to go ahead and camp with us and, uh, maybe stake the place out? I said, yeah, I'm game. So I went up there and, uh, you know, it's funny, you know, I, I hadn't been there in almost 20 years <clears throat> at that time. The place hadn't changed quite frank with you. So, um, we went into the area of the woods. Um, it was about 500 yards in from the main campsite, but it was up where the, um, the Conewaga and little Conewaga had the confluence of the two creeks. And, uh, we pulled our gear out and set up and everything. And by the time we got all set up, it was about, I don't know, about seven o'clock in the evening. And we just decided to stay around for that evening. Pretty uneventful that night. Though, um, <clears throat> that evening, you know, next morning we woke up and 
one of the, uh, I think it was John was saying that, uh, wanted to know if he heard footsteps at night. And I said, yeah, I had heard something. I said, well, I thought it was one of you guys walking around out there. And he said, no, nah. he said, he said he had heard movement that night. And of course, Andy had slipped straight through. He'd never heard a thing. So I just assumed, you know, I just assumed a deer or something got in there. So, cause nothing was disturbed, <clears throat> but I was wary, you know? So anyway, we, uh, we got up next, next morning and, uh, we went out and started looking around, had a, we were out there for, actually we went about two or three miles into the woods, maybe a little more, just looking around, weren't picking up anything, you know, didn't see anything. So we, I guess we made it back to the campsite about, oh, I guess about six o'clock or so that evening. And, uh, uh, you know, we just sitting there talking, you know, we're sitting there talking about, actually we were talking about football, I think. And, uh, about, oh, I don't know, a couple hours later, we heard something scream. It rang out by the west of us and upstream, you know, it was upstream from the location. You know, I thought it sounded like an owl at first, but a few minutes later it happened again. And it distinctively sounded like a child screaming. Now, hmm. I couldn't tell how far it was, but it lasted for several seconds, and it kind of seemed to fade in and out. So we got up, walked a few yards into the woods, and, uh, you know, we didn't hear anything else. So we walked back to the campsite, We're sitting around talking again, and then about an hour later, we heard it again. So... Uh, you know, we, we didn't know what thing. So I, we stayed up and, uh, you know, I stayed up the rest of the night. I think one of them went to sleep and the other was, yeah, that's right. Andy was with me that night. So, you know, we stayed up uh, full moon and, uh, you know, much of the Creek and the woods were pretty visible because of the full moon. So about one o'clock in the morning, I was walking the perimeter of the campsite and I started feeling like something was watching me. I got a real weird feeling. <clears throat> I told Andy, he woke John up and we, um, we started walking by the Creek. I guess we walked about 50 foot and without warning, we recognized to our right, a large dark figure that was standing right in the middle of the Creek because the Creek was fairly shallow there and it had bright red eyes. And by the time we could get the flashlights on it, this thing whooshed up straight up in the air like a rocket and uh a few seconds later we heard this same scream again and it was fading away moving away from us so we hurried back to campsite and started comparing notes on this thing uh my buddy andy he was shook he wasn't even talking he was just sitting there shaking you know john was he was pretty calm uh he estimated it was about six foot or so that's what i thought and we noticed that it had these large structures on its back, which, you know, we both thought looked like wings that were folded in the back. And I mean, it, it, it this thing had jettisoned so fast that we, like I said, we had flashlights, but we couldn't get the flashlights on it, but we definitely all saw these red, these red eyes. And, uh, so, you know, Andy was shook up. So they, uh, they walked back to the administration building and left everything and said they'd get everything, pick everything up in the morning. I stood around. I wanted to see what this thing was, but, um, it was quiet the rest of the night. Nothing else happened. So, you know, this, uh, so this got me interested in what was going on. Uh, and, and quite frank, I was aware of the malt man, you know, I'd known about that and, you know, I, I have been wondering if that's maybe it was something like that. I could, I didn't know, but you know, several years later, back in 2000, in 2008, which 20 years after my sighting, I had received an email from a man who lived in near Dick's dam, which is just downstream from where we were. And he stated he had heard screams for many years. And he said, the sounds continue to this day. So not long after that, I got another email 
from a uh, scout leader who said that, you know, he had been out to Camp Conawaga and his boys and his troop had come across this thing on the trail that they described as a dragon. And he said it was about six foot tall with wings and a tail, but it looked like it had fur or feathers. Wow. Wow. So, you know, he thought, you know, he thought they were pulling his leg. He didn't realize, you know, he didn't believe him. But when he saw the, my description of what happened to me, uh, cause I had posted on the blog, uh, then he thought different. So he contacted me and, uh, you know, let me know about, it. so in, since that time, since 2008, there have been five other sightings up and along the Conewaga Creek, uh, it extends from Northern, uh, Adams County east into um northern pennsylvania i'm excuse me northern york county then empties into the susquehanna river but along that route there's i mean along the river itself there have been five more sightings since then and the last sighting was about three years ago man i don't even i don't even know how to describe what you were seeing that you're is, a magnet yeah yeah well you know that the, the bigfoot sighting there have been the two you know the two encounters i've had Man, that's incredible. Well, if anyone listening to this has a sighting they'd like to report to Phantoms and Monsters and you, Lon, how do they go about doing that? Well, the best way to do it is to send me an email, lonstrickler at phantomsandmonsters.com, or go you know, go to the blog, which is phantomsandmonsters.com, and there are plenty of links there to contact me. And in addition to the blog, you also have written several books. Where do people find those? Oh, they're on Amazon. All you have to do is put uh, my name, Lon Strickler, in the search, or Phantoms and Monsters in the search, and they'll come up. And you're working on a new book, right? I'm working on a new book, and I I haven't really decided what I want to write about yet. <laughs> I'm just kind of getting in the process, but I believe, and I've got people trying to talk me into doing this, I, I believe that the main subject is going to be alien encounters. Oh, man, I can't wait to... To read that and in addition to that you also have a radio show yep arcane radio Arco arcane radio.com every wednesday at uh, 10 o'clock man that is incredible do you have any uh conferences or any places you're going to be speaking at soon or do you have anything new that's upcoming no i i go, I go to very few conferences i had uh i went last weekend we were at the uh pennsylvania bigfoot camping adventure uh and we were just there set up to take reports but I, I we're working at going to the possibly going to the Mothman Festival this September. Uh, that's still up in the air, but I, we may go to that. Okay. Is there anything else you'd like to promote? Mm, not really. Okay. I think that's about it. <laughs> Man, well, it's a ton. I, I urge everybody. I'm sure almost everyone listening to this has checked out your site. But if not, you got to get on over to Phantoms and Monsters. It's the best website on the internet as far as paranormal activity, cryptids, UFOs, you know, any unexplained phenomenon, alien beings, eyewitness accounts, anything that's alternative news. And we appreciate you so much for coming on here today and talking with us, Lon. No problem. All right. Take care. Mm, thank you. I'd like to take a moment, folks, to talk about another one of our great sponsors, Casper Beds. Now, according to the market, you're supposed to replace your bed about every 10 years or so. And sometimes, man, those things can cost quite a bit. Like I mentioned on the last show, I think, uh, me and my wife, we bought a tempur bed a couple of years ago. And I think we spent close to $5,000 by the time we were done. They are very expensive. and But Casper is changing the script, Cam. They're flipping the script. Mm -hmm. They're changing it. And you recently got a bed as well, right? Mm -hmm. Well, these beds are simply amazing. They shipped me and Cam a bed, and I've been sleeping on it. I love it. You said that your wife actually likes it better than the other bed that yes. you bought yes. not too long ago. Mm -hmm. And I think it has a lot to do with the quality. Uh, Casper used an in-house team of engineers, you know, and they spent thousands of hours developing these amazing 
beds. It combines, get this, supportive memory foam for a sleep surface that's got the right just amount, you know, it fits to your body. Just the right amount of bounce, just the right of comfort. It keeps you cool, so it helps you regulate your temperature throughout the night. Um, and the service is very convenient. That's what I love about it. You know, buying a Casper mattress, get this, is completely risk-free. Now, Casper offers free delivery and free returns with a 100-night home trial. So if you love it, or you, you can keep it. But if you don't like it, they'll actually come and pick it up and refund you everything. And... That's why I suggest you do. I suggest you try this bed out. I think you'll thank me later in some kind of email or something because it is, it, it really, it's amazing. And what's crazy is the way it's shipped to you. It comes in this really small box. And when it gets on your doorstep, you're going to be like, wait a minute, there's no way there's a bed in there. But there is. I don't know how they do it. They have some kind of crazy machine. Uh, it makes me think of the Doctor Who story, you know, the, the Thneeds, you know, the little workshop where yeah. he's creating things. Uh, well, the truffle of trees is what they're chopping down or something, but uh, <laughs> they must have some kind of crazy machine that compresses this foam into this box, and when you get it home, you roll it out, you take a knife, you cut it open, and all of a sudden, it just... Whoop. I love that. That's my favorite part. The boys were in shock, because <laughs> yeah. they were like, what? There's no way there's a bed in there, but it is pretty cool. Also, it's designed and developed and assembled in the USA, and they don't just make mattresses, folks. Casper also offers an adaptive pillow and soft, breathable sheets. Right now, you can get $50 towards any mattress purchase by visiting casper.com forward slash expanded. And don't forget to use the promo code expanded. That's www.casper.com forward slash expanded. And use the promo code expanded. Terms and conditions apply. And we're back with Expanded Perspectives. Uh, I love Phantoms and Monsters. I love the blog. I love all the work that Lon does. And look, folks, he doesn't get paid for any of this. I mean, just the revenue he probably generates from ads on the website. But, I mean, this isn't his job. So it really does take somebody with a lot of passion Mm -hmm. for the paranormal to continue to do this for so many years. I mean, other than him and Albert Rosales, I don't think there's two any better sites as far as sightings goes. I mean, not just does he have another radio show, Arcane Radio, but he also has several books you can purchase on Amazon. Yes. Yeah. I mean, it's our go-to spot. has been for years. I mean, and there's new posts every single day just about of the, all the greatest sightings. I mean, everybody knows Lon Strickler, and they know if you have a sighting, if it doesn't matter where it's reported, when somebody of some substance knows something or, given or, or has received a story, they always tell people, you yes. have to go to Lon. Go tell your story to Lon. Exactly. And he has this compendium of all these sightings. You can go big. You can get lost. I mean, I don't know how many times... I've been up uh, bored, started looking on Phantoms and Monsters, and then you get sucked in, and you click, and then you click, and then you click. You know what I'm saying? And you <laughs> yeah. look up out, and an hour has gone by, and you've been reading all of these sightings. But, you know, this is, seems like really good planning on our part, to have Seth Breedlove come on to talk about his new movie about the Mothman, and at the exact same time, there actually is a bunch of Mothman sightings. I mean, the biggest amount, the biggest wave of sightings, group sightings uh, collected together, since 1967. How crazy is that, right? Right. And then, just I mean, everything. Everything that he covers. I just, I love it. I mean, it's one of those things that I'm glad it's there. It's one of those, I'm really so thankful that, that the internet is here for this reason alone. To have these never-ending, and like I said, you can go back through and find and tie stuff together, and it's just, it's greatness. I mean, what about these sightings, though, in Illinois? I mean, it appears that something ominous is on the horizon there in Chicago, right? I hope not. I, I hope, hope not, not either, especially because all the stories of the Mothman is like a harbinger for danger, right? But even he's talking about like a giant owl. Yeah, you know, it's well, like, like your story of the, the crow. The crow, yeah. It's just, I don't know. It just The, the idea of a giant humanoid is disturbing enough. And you know, that's whether not or not disturbing. it's real, I don't know. Because I've never, you know, it's one of those things, look, I love to report on all the stories like we always talk about, but I've never had, I guess it's real easy to set and second guess and judge people that have these sightings because you've never had one yourself right to go obviously they've misidentified something obviously they're looking for attention obviously they're lying they're wrong something like that and and so that's always going to be in the back of my mind because i've never had an experience like that i don't know so no matter how much you learn and say you're open-minded there's still going to be a little bit of skepticism in anyone's mind until they have an experience 
and learn for themselves. I agree. 100%. And if the Mothman's not scary enough, we moved over into Dogman. Oh, yeah. That's another one of those things we've had people on. I love the stories, but I've never witnessed it. I don't know. No, I, I don't I would, want to. I think I'd rather see a Mothman than I would see a Something <laughs> about Dogman. Something yeah, about it. The yeah. The werewolf stuff. <laughs> yeah. You know, like I brought up on the during the interview is like, you know, till recently, you know, up to a couple of years ago, I'd never even heard of a Dogman sighting. I remember the yeah. first time I ever heard of one was like a hunter up near Thackerville, Oklahoma yep. had a sighting. Yep. Or the Beast of Bray Road that, you know, Linda Godfrey, of course, wrote about. Yeah. But outside of that, I never really heard about it. And it seems like either becoming it's either becoming more popular, so people are now seeing strange things in the woods and saying that it's Dogman, or they truly are having more sightings of an actual Dogman. Yeah. I don't know. Both are terrifying, right? Yeah. I don't know. Man. Both are equally disturbing. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Man, what did, what did you do this weekend? Man, besides just a, a little work, a little disc golf and whatnot, we watched uh, UFC 211. That's right. Yeah. You know, we had a great time watching that whole bad boy. We didn't go over there to it. Of course, it was over there. What is it? The AEC. It was over there in Dallas, but we didn't do yep. it. We just we chilled out here and watched it and the whole thing. And it was uh, great fights. The fights were unbelievable. I mean, it was... Man, uh, it was just a really good night of fights. It was. Uh, I feel bad for uh, uh, Eddie Alvarez and Dustin Poirier. It was an accidental foul. Eddie, Eddie, you know the way he need Dustin, and it was you know ruled a no contest. I feel kind of bad about that because that was going to be a great a great fight. Uh, Frankie Edgar pretty much dominated Yair, and I think it's gonna that's gonna end up helping Yair out tremendously. Learning right, that yeah. right there, uh, Joanna is a beast, hands down. Straight that woman beast. is a monster. Uh, Damien Maia did what Damien Maia does, and Stipe, who you can't tell either one of those guys. We, we, we knew it wasn't going to go out of the first round, so that was the heavyweight fight, folks. And it's just when you get two guys that skilled and that large, and they're throwing leather, you know somebody's going to go down. So incredible just the way it happened. It was a great night of fights. Yeah, it, and we got a bunch of other friends ended up showing the original up, four so. brud. The original four horsemen were together. That is true. The original four. That is true. <laughs> Our brud, the brown belt, Mister Monty Edwards, showed up, and then uh, Coach Cox, the Fox, Steve. He decided to roll in. He didn't let the Fox out while he was here, but we got some good stories we could share with you all about. Coach Cox, the Fox, getting loose. So, yeah, <laughs> we used to play softball, and it used to be a – he would sit at the end of the dugout with my nephew, and they would just pound beer <laughs> during a doubleheader. So, yeah, it was something else now. But, yeah, we had a great time. Speaking of uh, softball and stuff, we had our last baseball game of the season uh, yeah. for Jacob's team. But yeah. uh, soon we'll be picking up with uh, travel baseball. So Yeah, I mean, you told me that was probably coming. The so. party continues. Yeah. Well, before we get out of here, let's mention our sponsors. Don't forget about Gaia.com, folks. That's G A I A. You can go over there and they have over 7,000 titles, all kinds of movies, uh, self help, yoga, uh, you know, transcendental meditation, as well as documentaries on incredible things and different series over there like Deep Space and Truth Hunter. A ton of stuff. You're going to love it. If you like this show, you're going to love it. Go over there, use our promo code to get a, uh, a discount. That's G A I A dot com forward slash expanded perspectives also casper beds don't forget if you want an amazing sleep experience choose casper beds now casper offers a free delivery and free returns with a hundred night home trial if you don't love it they'll pick it up and refund you everything if you act now you'll get fifty dollars towards any mattress purchased by visiting casper.com forward slash expanded and using the promo code expanded also dollar shave club i'm telling you folks man if you want an incredible shave there's no better a service out there in Dollar Shave Club for a limited time. New members get their first month of the Executive Razor with a tube of Dr. Carver's Shave Butter for only $5 with free shipping. And after that, razors are just a few bucks a month. And in your first month box, you'll get an awesome weighted handle full of cassettes with four cartridges and a tube of the Shave Butter. But you have to use the promo code dollarshaveclub.com forward slash expanded. That's dollarshave.com forward slash Expanded. Also, folks, if you like Expanded Perspectives and you'd like to support the show and you need more material, don't forget about Expanded Perspectives Elite. Uh, just on last week's show, I was talking about Ro uh, Russia's Roswell. Mm -hmm. It's very interesting. Uh, you better go over there and check that out. You have to go to the website, expandedperspectives.com, click on the Elite tab, and you sign up through PayPal. It's only $5 a month, and what you'll get is you'll get an extra episode every week as well as access to the entire back catalog. I think there's 143 episodes up there now, Jeez. depending on when you hear this. <laughs> uh, next week, it'll be 144. You know, it just continues to go up. It comes out every Friday, so some months you actually get five episodes. Mm -hmm. What an incredible deal for only $5. If you have a story you would like to share with us, 
Don't forget about Expanded Perspectives at Yahoo.com. That's the email. You can send your story over to us, and we can read it, or Mary can look at it and send it to us. You can call the show, 817-945-3828. And don't forget, folks, if you have questions you'd like to send, Q&A with Cam and Kyle is still in effect. We're not going to be reading any of those this weekend uh, on this episode because of the busy weekend we had with Mother's Day and everything. But we will next week. Remember, in the title of your email, put Q&A with Cam and Kyle. You can ask us any question you want to. And if you're lucky enough, uh, you might get your email selected and we'll answer it on the air. Yes, Cam. Uh, just to let everybody know, folks, uh, this upcoming weekend, I'm going to be in Las Vegas. That's right. I have got a wedding to do. So if you're up around Vegas and you want to hit me up, fire us off a question, send it to the, the Facebook page or tweet us or something along those lines, email us, something like that, and let us know. And I'll see if I can end up getting together with somebody while we're up there. I think I'm actually going to record an episode with Shannon Legro of Into the Fray. I'm going to jump on there and do a little show with her, I believe, if we can work all that stuff out. We'll see how that works. So, uh, yeah, if you want to get together and, and point some stuff out, I'm going to be running around Vegas somewhere out there. So holler at me. That is awesome. I got an invitation to a graduation celebration. One of my good friends, high school friends, Chris Penny, I'd like to give him a shout out. Yep. Get this, Cam. He just graduated with a master's degree from Massachusetts Institute of Technology. Technology. That's right, folks. A close friend of mine graduated with a master's degree from MIT. Who would have ever thought it? If you would have ran around with me and him back in the day, you never would have believed it. But look how far, how high he's climbed compared to me. Well, that was, uh, <laughs> he, he and I was talking at the uh, the going way of another friend of ours that uh, moved to Italy. And so we're all doing a, a money raising thing coming up this December with, with Chris. He suckered me and Kyle into it. Yeah, so. My hat's oh, off to Chris, him. What yeah. an incredible amount of work that must take. Oh, yeah. Because he's already a father with a full-time job and a family. Yeah. Um, you know, a wife and two lovely daughters. But what an incredible accomplishment. I hope everybody out there has a safe week, a good week. Work hard, folks. Summer's almost here. It's time to get back in shape and look on those tans, get to working on them. Cam? You're going to get your ears lowered? You're going to keep shaving that dog? I'm like bringing that it summer? down. I'm actually, yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm working. I'm, I'm never... I got to be careful. I don't get it sunburned. Well, make sure you be. Yeah, put some cream on there. Wear a hat for God's sake. Right? You're out there playing disc golf. <laughs> yeah. Everybody, be careful, folks. I'm Kyle Filson. He's Cam Hale. Peace, y'all. Go on.